over the um, over the bar. You should see the chat box. We've also got the Q and A, um, which would be fantastic if people could, um, you know, uh, ask questions as we go throughout. We're going to be taking a short break halfway through to answer some questions, and we're going to be answering some more questions at the end of the webinar as well. Um, so it's not just myself uh, on the webinar today. Um, I will be hosting the first part of the webinar, um, and I'll also um, be introducing Jonathan Scott from Northern Media. Jonathan, if you're there, just say a quick hello. Morning, everybody. How you doing? Good stuff. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so the plan is um, for the first half of the webinar, we'll be primarily focusing on uh, CRM. And uh, as we progress through, we're going to start to talk about marketing and then obviously how CRM can assist with marketing. So I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. Again, I encourage people to uh, pop stuff in the chat box as we work our way through. So let me just find my screen, the right one to share. And then once with perfect. So you should all see now on the screen, just a sort of welcome slide. Uh, and again, I want to take this opportunity. So I've thanked Rory and Umi for having me on the webinar today. I just want to thank um, everyone who is attending and listening to the presentation today from myself uh, and from Jonathan as well, uh, just extending a big thank you. So I'm just going to check the chat box to make sure everybody can see my screen. If you can't see my screen, okay, please, uh, please do let me know because I want to make sure of that just now. Yes, I can see. I can see there's a comment there. Somebody saying good morning. Just want to make sure we've got Ella from Armament Partnerships uh, based in Skipton. Um, can somebody just please pop in the chat if they can see my screen, okay? I sort of gather straight away that you can all hear me okay. And I've got somebody who said yes straight away. So that's fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Very helpful. I don't want to get uh, two hours into the presentation and then find out uh, where Rory says, oh, we couldn't even see you or hear you. We, we all just sort of dropped off. So um, I'll, I'll introduce myself first. My name is George McKee. I am the sales and marketing director um, at a CRM firm called All My Systems. Um, we are... Uh, in fact, I want to go into this uh, in the next slide just a second before I do a sort of full on intro of AMS. Um, but then, of course, the second half of the webinar, as I've already mentioned, is going to be hosted by Jonathan Scott, who is a co-owner and director of a marketing agency called Northern Media. Um, I thought it'd be a, an extremely um, good opportunity to get Jonathan on the on the webinar today as well. Um, my background is CRM and I've been working in CRM for the last four years. Um, I work with many different types of businesses as all my systems. We build very bespoke systems and databases, CRM, uh, ERP uh, systems, so many different platforms. Um, Jonathan Scott, however, is a specialist in marketing, um, so I thought it'd be very valuable to have him on the call today. So, I'll just slide on to my next slide. I want to make sure my slides are all working okay as well. Um, firstly, we're just going to cover the agenda before I um, sort of go uh, through the motions. Um, first thing we're going to look at in this part one of the webinar is going to be a little bit about all my systems. So I'm going to explain who we are. After that, I'm going to start very basic uh, and I'm going to sort of explain what CRM is. Now, that might seem very basic, but a lot of times I go to networking events or I go to presentations or I'm talking with people and they don't really know what CRM is because it can mean a lot of different things to different people. So I'm going to cover that as a basis to start. From there, we're going to talk about who needs CRM and why. So really putting some meat on the bone to actually find out me as a business. So then again, there's about 50 or 60 businesses on the, on the webinar today. Me as a business, why is it important to me? How is it going to help me? We're going to look at how CRM can help to increase revenue. Um, we're going to talk about how CRM can be a little bit of a minefield and how to make sure that you're choosing the right platform for you. Uh, I speak to many business owners and I have done over the last four years about CRM. And I've spoke to a lot of people that have jumped from platform to platform and they just can't really find something that works for them. So we're going to talk almost about the different tiers of going completely bespoke, taking something off the shelf. Um, taking something and then configuring the platform. So we'll talk about all those different methods. Then of course, we're gonna to start to talk a bit more about marketing before I hand over to Jonathan. So we're gonna talk about firstly, how CRM can help connect marketing and sales and have them work together. And then finally, I'm gonna to hand over to Jonathan Scott from Northern Media. 
Um, but at that halfway point, we are gonna take the opportunity to take some questions. Um, so I, again, as I work my way through the presentation today, I do really encourage you to ask questions because uh, we're gonna try and get back to as many as we can. Um, one thing I'm gonna ask everybody to do now, again, some of you have already been using the chat box uh, and that's fantastic. We wanna try and keep this as interactive as possible. If we could have done it um, face to face under normal circumstances, of course, there'll be a lot of interaction back and forth with the crowd. I might even try and make a few people giggle uh, as we work through the presentation, which is going to be pretty uh, tricky when I can't hear any of you. Um, but I do encourage you to use the chat box as much as you can. Um, so firstly, I'll explain a little bit about myself, a little bit about AMS. Um, so again, my name is George. I'm the Sales and Marketing Director here at All My Systems. Um, my background, uh, so I've been in sales and marketing for the last 11 years. The last four years of that really coming into the technology sector. Um, I've always wanted to sort of break into to software and software sales. Um, and really doing that over the last four years has been a massive um, learning curve. Um, I've realized that a lot of businesses, large and small, um, don't, th that might have a really good uh, front end, fantastic website, and almost seem to have everything together in the back. So the CRM side of stuff um, behind the scenes might not always be as smooth as people will think. Uh, and sometimes you would think that the bigger the business, um, the more infrastructure and the better they have their, their back end systems. Not always the case. Still lots of Excel spreadsheets, lots of manual tasks. Lots of um, uh, managers and people in sort of high positions have a lot of stuff in their head, uh, which isn't systemized, which means there's a lot of knowledge that can be lost from the business. Um, so it's been a lot of learning for me. I've absolutely loved working with CRM and I plan to do so for the long future. Um, all my systems, so a bit about us, we specialize in three things. Um, we are not a jack of all trades. We really do only work in these things. So the three are CRM systems. So again, that primarily looks at marketing, at sales, maybe a little bit of customer service before you move over to ERP. Um, now, if people have not heard of ERP, um, ERP is more of an operational and a finance system. So if you can think of um, manufacturers or engineering businesses, people who um, fabricate things, maybe distribution companies who have shipping, um, so they will use ERP systems. So ERPs are more, again, operational, sort of um, sales order processing, stock, purchasing suppliers and then finally we specialize in analytics uh, analytics is something that um, is again not really used much in, in even in larger businesses one thing that business owners and management are always craving is better reports nice visuals better data so good management information so they can make informed decisions on the business where at the minute when i go into a lot of organizations um, there's a lot of guesswork, there's a lot of manipulation being done in Excel spreadsheets, which is, of course, extremely manual, cumbersome and time consuming. All my systems, we are based in Hebden Bridge, West Yorkshire. Um, I'm sure some of you on the call today will have heard of all my systems before, and I'm sure a lot of you would have heard of Hebden Bridge before. Really cool, quirky little town, um, bang in the middle of Leeds and Manchester. Um, and uh, probably about 15 minutes outside of Halifax. And we've also got an office based in Huddersfield as well. Um, that's a view from our office, which is absolutely stunning. I always love that. We was founded back in 2014 by our managing director, Mark Puller. He founded the business with his wife, Bryony, after working in many sort of corporate roles in IT consultancy positions. Um, and he really just wanted to start working with SMEs um, on projects that actually finished. Of course, a lot of large corporate um, systems and projects can go on for years and years, and they have many sort of hundreds of thousands of users. Um, we really focus on um, smaller implementations of maybe teams from anywhere from 10 up to about 250, um, very manageable projects. Um, and our um, goal is to really make um, systems that will go in place in the business, create efficiencies, create as much automation as possible and, uh, and happy users. Um, but more importantly than all of that, improve the customer journey because that's all businesses want to do. Um, again, founded in 2014, um, growth was uh, fairly slow at the beginning, pretty steady, which was uh, what Mark wanted to do over the last two and a half years. So I've been with the business for three and a half. Over the last two and a half, there's been a, a really sort of rapid um, 
growth within the business. We're at 14 people now and rapidly growing uh, and coronavirus permitting, we've planned to be about 18 at the end of the year. We are a Microsoft Dynamics 365 um, Silver partner. So that is a um, CRM platform and it's also an ERP platform as well. I'm not gonna be talking too much about that today because of course today is not about a product, it's not a pitch. Uh, this is all gonna be informative. Um, so I want you today to take away something from today's webinar rather than just feel like I've spoke to you about a product. Um, all my systems, our mission is to give, the, um, to give UK SMEs the same powerful tools that the larger players have and that will result in happy users. Again, I'm gonna skim past this um, because again, it's not really about this today. Um, it's more about, um, again, information and giving something back. Um, the three products that we, that we do, of course, is CRM. So this obviously um, tells you how qualified we are to deliver presentations such as this. Um, CRM such as uh, marketing, sales, customer service, field service, all the way through to project management. Again, so I scroll back slightly. That is a prime example of how I say CRM can mean different things to different people because a lot of people will really think that CRM means, uh, CRM just means accounts, contacts, and maybe activities. Some people will think actually, well, we, we, we use CRM to do our sales pipeline and our quoting. Other people will think as maybe something like Zendesk or Freshdesk where they'll do their customer service, so tickets and raise cases. Uh, I've just seen in the chat box, somebody said, hope we didn't flood. No, actually the office didn't flood, um, but the, the yeah, town was uh, hit pretty badly, but um, some very swift recovery, which is great. Um, other, other businesses will use CRM more for field service, so creating jobs and job management. And then finally, some will really use it for the full end to end, so they'll go right into project management and invoices. So again, CRM can mean different things to different people. Um, because it can do so much. It depends on the platform that you choose. And that's, of course, down to um, the work and the due diligence that you do at the beginning of your project. I'm going to skim past these other two. That's what I said, um, ERP before, and then BI, which is reports and analytics, which does typically tap into CRM. So typically out of CRM, you will be able to get some um, fairly standard views and dashboards, depending on what uh, system you're actually using. But something like a reporting tool like Power BI or maybe Crystal Reports or something like that just really takes the cumbersome sort of manual process away from doing reports and spreadsheets. So again, starting completely uh, from scratch, what is CRM? Uh, so CRM, like I said, can mean different things to different people. It's a bit of a minefield because if you just Google CRM or CRM for sales or CRM for, for quoting, there's so much that will come up and you'll see a few that will dominate. You will see Dynamics 365, you'll see Salesforce, you'll probably see Zoho and Pipedrive, uh, you might see Act. Um, these are all sort of very popular um, platforms, um, but to be honest, it, it doesn't matter how good the marketing is for one platform, it's not necessarily going to be the best platform for you. So as a standard, what is CRM? It's customer relationship management. So the idea is that you keep all of your customers and or prospects in a system so you can see everything that's going on with that customer or with that prospect at any given time. So if you've got a salesperson called Dave, Dave is working with a particular customer, he might be quoting them for something, or he might be um, calling up to follow up on an order or an invoice or whatever it might be. And then Dave is on holiday the next day and Sharon is gonna pick up um, on the work that Dave was doing. If you don't have a CRM system in place, if it's really relied on um, email communication or everything's in Outlook or Excel spreadsheets or it's an old access database and people don't really tend to log their phone calls, that's when your customer experience and customer journey starts to sour because the customer might get exactly the same or in, the customer might get a very different conversation from two people and the same questions over and over again because all the communications have not been logged. And that obviously makes you look not very professional and it makes it look like your backend systems are not very advanced. Um, so if we have a good solid CRM in place and everything gets logged, so it might be integrated with your phone system. So um, phone calls are automatically logged and you can rec uh, have voice recordings as well um, from the phone calls. You might automatically log tasks or you might create a task and assign it off out to somebody else. All of that activity, so whether it's emails, tasks, phone calls, appointments, um, proposals, quotes, um, SMS messages that can be sent from the system, they should all really be in a solid CRM stored against an account or a contact record. 
when you think of CRM, uh, the standard entities or the standard pieces of functionality that are within most CRM systems would be accounts, contacts, um, if it's a sales system, leads, opportunities, of course, activities like I've just mentioned, and then you would ideally want some dashboards and views. For instance, if you're using it for leads and opportunities, you might want a lead creation and a lead conversion dashboard to look at <clears throat> what leads have been created, what's the source of the leads, um, what's the conversion rate, which salespeople are working with which leads, and then through to opportunity. When you're working on opportunity, then you'll typically have a little bit more information. So a lead, you would qualify and turn it into an opportunity. Uh, in some of your CRM systems that you guys are using, uh, you might see that named as inquiry, which then goes to prospect. So there's gonna be different terminologies in all different systems. So an opportunity, you would tend to have an estimated close date, estimated revenue. So you could look at forecasting and potential deals that might come in. So they're all pretty standard things that you would want from a, a, a pretty standard CRM system. A little bit more advanced on the sales side, you might also do your quotes within the system as well. Um, again, this could be done on an ERP system. This could be done on an access database or a SQL database. Um, a quotes, uh, quotes, products, price list, orders, then right through to a little bit more um, reports on, on, on sales, on order. So by drilling down on different orders, order types, um, profit margins, that kind of stuff to come if you're using more sales advanced functionalities. Uh, if you're using your CRM system to also sort of log complaints or tickets, then you'll typically have uh, cases, service calls, tickets that get stored against an account as well. If you've got a customer service team uh, or a team that just deals with these kind of things, or there's a bit of a, um, a process of who gets assigned these, these complaints or cases, then you typically have queues. So a case would go into a queue and then get assigned out to the relevant person. Could be based on a round robin. It could be based on uh, their skill set or who's the account manager for that account. And then all the way through to portals and SLAs. So if you've really got an advanced customer service system, then you might have a portal for the customer. You could also have that for a, for a sales system as well. Um, so many of the implementations that we've done, you will have, um, if you've got a larger account, maybe a portal. So the account has a username and password. They can log in. They can see all of their uh, quotes, all of their orders, all of their projects that they're on at the moment. So you can do some really advanced stuff with portals and some systems as well. And then SLAs, which is service level agreements against cases. Um, I put a bit more into the marketing side because, of course, that's what everyone's come here to find out a bit more about today. So in a lot of sort of advanced um, marketing CRM systems like, um, again, Salesforce is um, pretty good for that. Um, HubSpot, maybe Cooler Hub. If you, you're looking to use a more local company, there's a great um, CRM system from a local company based in Harrogate called Cooler Hub. Uh, Dynamics 365 has marketing functionalities as well. So what you would want to uh, use um, marketing functionality for within CRM would really be a hub for all of your campaigns. So whether that's a PPC campaign, an expo that you go into, a new product that's being launched, to really bring sales and marketing together, you ideally want to have all campaigns as uh, the lead entity um, really within the marketing side of the system. And then from there, using segmentation list or marketing list to segment down your data. So you might have, that could be your customers. You might want to look at your premium customers. So your top 10 spenders, you might want to look at your smaller customers or your more recurring, uh, more transactional customers, and they might all be segmented into different lists. It might be customers that have purchased different kind of products or customers that have spent a certain amount with you. Um, it's a really smart way to slice and dice your data so that when you are doing marketing campaigns, you're not just doing a shotgun approach. It's a much more sniper approach. Um, so it's a lot more targeted. Um, the next one would be to do e-shots directly from the system. So uh, again, if a lot of people are interested in doing more with marketing, they might have heard of tools like Campaign Monitor or MailChimp or Dot Digital. Um, there's or uh, light mail. There's so many different marketing tools. Um, most CRM systems should integrate with those tools if they are cloud-based, which most systems are now. Um, so if you integrate with those tools, you would still use that tool to create that really nice branded template and maybe some automation. But you would use your CRM system 
um, to really segment down your data and choose who you want to send that um, shot out to. And then coming on to analytics, if you if you have integrated your CRM system with your marketing tool, um, some of you may have used marketing tools. In fact, I'm going to get everybody to try and uh, use the chat for the first time. Um, so if anybody's used a marketing tool and a CRM, I'd please like them to pop it in the chat box. So whether they've got them integrated as well, if you've got maybe Salesforce integrated with Dotmailer or you've got... Um, sales logic integrated with, uh, with um, MailChimp, please pop that in the chat because I'll use some examples when I, when I come back to it in just a moment. But having your analytics come into the CRM is really important because it's, it, it's very powerful to do an e-shot and send out an email to a thousand people and then you can look in MailChimp and say, okay, well of those thousand people, we had 700 op email opens, 200 clicks, and then 300 people, and then 25 people went on the website, and then seven people watched this video. Well, that's great, that's really powerful information, but that normally sits with the marketing manager, because it would be the marketing manager, typically, who has access to Dotmailer, or Lightmailer, or Campaign Monitor, or MailChimp. Salespeople don't generally have access to those tools, which creates a silo between marketing and sales. That's where you would want the two integrated because what you can do within most CRM systems now is when you get um, somebody open an email and click on a link and watch a video that can automatically create a lead within your CRM system and assign it to a salesperson. So a salesperson, they might have a notification on their mobile phone that says, Hey, there's a new lead. Somebody's clicked on this product. Um, and it might diarize a phone call in their diary to get back to that person straight away. So what does that do? That creates a better lead follow-up, it creates a better customer journey, and it's more than likely gonna increase your revenue as well. So of course, a big part of um, how much do we invest in CRM, which CRM do we go for? It needs to prove that it's got a good return on investment. So by looking at stuff like that, so the automations and being intelligent and, and clever and planning out your own automations and how they're going to work for your business, that's all gonna increase the return on investment. But moving on from the analytics, the analytics are a key part though. Um, you've got events. So in most, uh, in most CRM systems, it's got a good marketing module. You can use the events module. So within the event, you might say we spent, we went to this event, or uh, so say you was exhibiting an event. We spent 500 pounds on the stand. We took free salespeople. We had an hotel overnight. We've got this much travel and we bought sweets and balloons for the stand. So the investment into going to the event was 1500 pounds. Now, from that event, we want to track all of our leads, all of our opportunities, all of our quotes, and all of our orders and the order values to look at the return and investment from that event. That, again, comes back to the analytics, but you need a good, solid marketing module within your CRM system to do that. I'm going to kind of skim past the rest, um, but you can see in most CRM systems that have got a good, solid marketing module, you'll be able to send out surveys. Again, that can be automatic. You might say, when an order has been fulfilled, wait two days to send them out a survey. You might use SMS messages to keep them updated throughout. Um, if they've signed up for an event, they might get an SMS message with a link um, for all the speakers throughout the day. Just nice stuff like that really improves the customer journey. Review, reviews, which might be um, sending out Google links or Trustpilot links through the CRM system to try and um, prompt your customers, your existing customers and new customers to, to have reviews. And then again, uh, you would more use the marketing tool for this, but creating customer journeys and automations. Um, so just an example of that is I send an email out to Barbara and I say, if Barbara clicks on the email, then we're going to send her this. If she doesn't click on the email, we're going to wait three days and then we're going to send her uh, another email which has got a video in it, for instance. So I'll just try and change up that journey and that automation. Before I move on to the next slide, I'm just going to go into the chat box because quite a few of you have put some, um, some things in there. And I hope that would be about what CRM systems that you're using and what tools you're using. Fantastic it is. <laughs> that flooding thing does make me laugh. Uh, we've got um, HubSpot um, and MailChimp. Uh, that's great. I'd be interested to find out if those two are connected in any way, because I know that HubSpot um, as a standalone product is quite powerful on the marketing side. So that was Liam who asked that. So Liam, are they integrated? Are they both standalone? Do you have a bit of a silo between sales and marketing or do you feel that they're quite well connected? Um, we've got Patrick who said we use Dynamics. Um, and we use Bright Office. Okay, Bright Office is not one that comes up very often. So I'll be interested again to find out are those two integrated or is that a standalone product? 
And then also, Patrick, are you on the cloud-based version, Dynamics 365? Are you on like a previous version? Use MailChimp before. We use Booth Book. Early stages for me, just using MailChimp. Uh, I would say that um, if you are if you are at early stages, if you're a smaller business and you're you're looking to you know you're, you're looking to scale and do a bit more on the marketing side, MailChimp really is a good place to start. Um, it's, it is one of the sort of industry leaders for SMEs. The good thing about MailChimp, I think, I, I, don't quote me on this, I think it's about the first two and a half thousand contacts that you want to send out to are absolutely free, so no charge. I know some of the other ones as well will have no charge, um, but MailChimp is extremely easy to use. They've got great support. There's lots of videos. I don't sell it, by the way. It's just a, a, a genuine opinion that I think it's a very good one. I use MailChimp registered for HubSpot. They aren't linked as of yet. Uh, I've used MailChimp, but not CRM. I have a spoke CRM, not happy with it. Give me a call, Joanne. Uh, and looking to use MailChimp. Um, I've been using really simple CRM. Uh, really simple CRM um, from Ella. Ella, if you can just answer my question back to you. Is that the one that's very similar to an Excel spreadsheet? So it's nice and easy to update, to record contacts and activities, not been linked to any other programs, separately have MailChimp. Um, I've tried Capsule CRM and HubSpot. Cool, so I won't go through too many more. Um, Emma uses Dynamics 365, MailChimp not connected uh, in the process of integrating new apps. Okay, fantastic. So lots of people are already using Dynamics, lots of people are using HubSpot, lots of people are using MailChimp, so some really good tools. So again, I know that I'm not talking to complete beginners all over, we've got lots of different levels in here, which is fantastic, it's always nice to have a mix. Um, I'm gonna move on to my next slide now. So who needs CRM and why? I am going to whiz through this one quite quick because I think that most people um, on the call today are already using CRM. There was a few there on the webinar uh, in the chat that I could see that wasn't. Um, generally, the people that need CRM the most and the businesses that find that they have most um, gain when they get a CRM in place is businesses that run um, very heavily on Excel spreadsheets. Excel spreadsheets, so Excel is an absolutely brilliant tool. It's part of the Office 365 stack, which we use, you know, it's a great tool. Um, but it really does, what tends to happen is when a lot of businesses start up or they're extremely small, rather than going for new tools and, uh, you know, invest in big money in software, which I completely understand, a lot of people use Excel spreadsheets and a lot of people are brilliant with them in creating formulas and macros and workflows and things that happen sort of automatically. Um, but the problem with Excel spreadsheets is typically, unless they're sat in the cloud and lots of people are using the one shed sh uh, spreadsheet and sharing it, a sales manager might have a, a master spreadsheet and then three salespeople beneath the sales manager, they might use their own individual spreadsheets. And the data in the master spreadsheet is not updated by the individual spreadsheets. What tends to happen is it's a lot of chasing, a lot of you haven't updated this or this doesn't look correct. And then what tends to happen is management. So people in sort of higher positions or even end users lose trust and lose faith in their data. And when you start to lose trust in your data, um, it could even, it doesn't need to be in spreadsheets. It could be in CRM if it's not updated. It's a really sticky place to be because you don't ever want to use that data for um, mailing out to people. You don't want to use it for prospecting. You don't really want to um, assume that the data is correct because there's just no trust in it. And that means that the data becomes meaningless. Um, what I would recommend is um, that every business, large or small, has some kind of data cleansing uh, regime. So for instance, at all my systems, uh, every month, uh, me and the marketing manager who works just beneath me, we sit down and we've got a standard set of reports. So that might be contacts that have been added in the last 30 days that don't have an address or they don't have an email um, address or a phone number or uh, accounts that have been added that don't have a contact. So how can we know a business but not know a person? So we've got a standard set of reports that we go through them and that's all generated by a CRM. So typically uh, businesses that have too many Excel spreadsheets really do tend to suffer. Um, more importantly so when they try to do reports on spreadsheets. Um, we helped out a business once um, that were a very decent size based in Leeds. Obviously I won't mention any names. The operations director who was fairly high up, it was quite a large business, um, was generating a report. So delivery reports, sales reports, um, inventory, stock management reports, all on spreadsheets. And it was taking up about a fifth, so 20% of her workload. Um, so when we sat down to look at a return on investment on implementing, this was for an ERP system, or CRM could have been exactly the same for the sales side. When we sat down to look at a return on investment, we looked at, well, 
20%, so a fifth of your operations director's time is being spent on generating these reports. If, an example figure, your operations director is on £50,000, you're spending £10,000 per year just on generating these spreadsheets. Well, if you were to have these reports built into your CRM or your management tool or whatever you might be using, then you're actually saving £10,000 per year. Now, of course, it's sometimes it's hard to get that return on investment across because it's not cash in their hand. They're still going to be paying their operations director. But that operations director can then focus on other parts of the business. We typically have uh, businesses that we go into and help. A lot of uh, MDs, sales directors, operations directors, management staff spending too much time in the business firefighting and, and, and working on stuff like these spreadsheets and trying to pull stuff together rather than looking at the bigger picture, the strategy and working on more time spending um, more time being spent talking with prospects and clients and trying to increase renewals and the existing customer base and find new prospects and new new customers um, so that's what we really look at when we look at a return on investment so that's one of the key reasons to get a crm in place uh, another one would be fragmented systems so that might be that you've got three or four really good systems like mailchimp and hubspot and zero and a quoting tool called bishop and then you've got um, a spreadsheet that you keep for all of your renewals and none of them are connected, so that's fragmented, which means a few things. It means you've got data duplication, and it means that typically people are dual keying data from one place to another. So another business that we helped out was a steel fabrication business. When the lead come in, they would fill out a lead form. Uh, when they would quote for that lead, they would fill out a quote form. Um, when they um, created an order for that prospect, they would um, put it onto Sage Line 50, and they would also put it onto an access database because that's where their stock was held. So for that one lead and that one order, they are typing that into four different systems. That's uh, not great for GDPR because you've got data all over the place in different areas and different systems. There's silos. It's uh, not good for the user experience of the, the person who's working for the business because they're duplicating data, which is a waste of time. Um, so we looked at having an all-in-one flowing platform where a lead would convert to an opportunity, to a quote, to an order, to an invoice, and that would integrate with Sage. So all the way along is what we typically look at when we look at the all my systems piece or when you might talk to uh, your CRM provider, that is typically the goal. The end goal is to have the automated process all the way through to minimize frustrated users, frustrated managers, and then of course, frustrated business owners. That is normally the compelling event or the catalyst for a business uh, implementing a new CRM system or, an, or a, any kind of new systems. It's really people that get fed up and frustrated with all the things above. All these spreadsheets, data duplication, time being wasted, poor reports, data that you can't trust. Oh, I skipped ahead of myself there. Poor reports, no trust in the system data, manual and repetitive tasks. And then one thing would still be, we don't see it too much now. We're seeing it less and less, um, which is a good sign. But paper-based processes and paper-based businesses, there seems to be, especially in the sort of, um, it happens a lot in manufacturing and sort of large organizations that are a lot of people on site. We see a lot of paper-based processes. So like I just mentioned them with the steel fabrication company, a, a, a lead form, an, an inquiry form, a quote form, an order form that gets typed up onto this system. Then it, then it gets turned into a, an invoice, which gets typed up finally. But paper-based processes, um, as much as they are great for admin people that may be a little bit stuck in their way of working a certain way, so they've got their five um, folders in front of them, a folder for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and they can see stuff moving from one folder to the next and they'll their to-do list. Um, as much as that's possibly great for a user that's kind of stuck in their ways and doesn't want change, it's really not scalable for a business. It's really not great for management to get uh, data real time and get it quick. So that ends up with a lot of people looking like this is how most of my prospects, the most of the people that I talk to, they typically look like this. I just have to tell them to put down the hammer, put down the keyboard. We can fix it. Uh, how can CRM help increase your revenue? Because again, this is the main driver. If a lot of you are looking at CRM uh, for the first time, if a lot of you have CRM, but you're looking to upgrade, if you've got a CRM that you're not happy with and you're looking to sort of get things changed, you really want to see how is this going to help us? Um, and the decision maker, the end person who's going to sort of sign the check is going to want to see how is this going to increase revenue? How is it going to increase the bottom line? Well, a few ways, really. The most important way 
uh, the main thing that we look to do is when we're implementing a new CRM system, yes, it really does need to work for the users at the back end. You want happy staff, you want them to enjoy using systems. If they feel like a system's not being used, then it's just going to seem like an admin task. But the most important thing is that you have a seamless customer journey. Uh, now I'll talk about, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say this quite quick, but I will talk about um, one of these systems that we implemented about five years ago for a very, very small client of ours. There are only four people in the business. Um, so they're typically, uh, in terms of the size of businesses that we normally work with, they're a little bit smaller than who we normally work with. They started out with a very, very basic lead management system because they couldn't contact their leads, their prospects quick enough. They work in a very competitive and sort of ferocious uh, dog eat dog industry and they couldn't follow up on their leads quick enough and they was using Excel spreadsheets and their Excel spreadsheets obviously wasn't giving them reminders or prompts or it wasn't saying, you know, making a little noise saying, hey, you need to ring Jenny back, otherwise you're gonna miss this opportunity because it's just an Excel spreadsheet. So they implemented a very basic lead management system. It was a small implementation at just four users of the system. Fast forward um, six years to today, um, there's still only four people in the business, but they've increased their revenue by over 50%. So the, they didn't want to put the system in just to grow the business because they don't want to grow the business. They wanted more control and they wanted to increase profitability. What we've really done with this customer over the last six years, um, and we've done four or five phases of development through this time, is we've looked at the customer journey and we've looked at creating automation because their system, uh, sorry, their business was extremely uh, it was a spreadsheet, but it's very sort of manual and it's step by step. We need to do all these things. So because they're a volume based business and it's manual, that's a recipe for disaster because the more people, the more customers that you've got, the more admin heads, the more people that you need to hire to do with these customers. So profitability um, very rarely goes up. So what we've worked on is really automating processes, improving the customer journey for renewals and retention, but automating the whole onboarding for new customers. Um, so like I said, their business has now uh, grown by over 50% um, in terms of profitability year on year, but they're the same amount of heads within the business. They've just created a really automated back end, um, which is really what we want to do for people is create automations and efficiencies. Another way that we can, uh, another way that we can increase revenue is really by understanding your customers better. Because if you are, uh, again, a transactional business, or it might be that you're a business that has a very long sales cycle, it doesn't matter which, it's always, or if you're B2B or B2C, you need to understand your customers. You need to understand um, buy-in trends and which products are selling and to who and which customer buys at which time of the year and what's their buy-in trends over the last five years, for instance. By better understanding your customer, that's going to then better um, gear you up to market to them again to sell more to existing customers selling to existing customers is always a lot easier than going out and finding new customers but sometimes people find it quite hard to try and resell or upsell their existing customers they might feel a bit bad because of the relationship um, if we can find out what the customer is doing with our products or our services and how we can better sort of improve their customer journey and their workflow then understanding your customers better is extremely important um, by having better data of your, um, of your, by, by having better data and a knowledge of your business, of course, you're going to be able to make more informed decisions uh, going forward. Understanding buying trends, as I mentioned before, um, this is a key one. And when we're talking about marketing, especially when I invite Jonathan on to talk, understanding lead generation and lead quality. So if we're doing all of our marketing from the system, we've invested £5,000 this year into um, SEO, so organic stuff for our website. We've invested £20,000 into pay-per-click campaigns. We've invested £10,000 into Google Ads. Um, oh, sorry, that was, um, sorry, <laughs> that was pay-per-click campaigns into Facebook Ads. And then we've invested £50,000 um, going to Expos. Well, okay, we can see there from, from all of these different lead sources or, or campaign sources, I can see that um, organic through the website, we've got 50 leads. Um, through my pay-per-click campaigns, I've got 150 leads. Through my Facebook campaigns, I've got 25 leads. And then through my expos, I've got seven leads. Well, from there, that's great because I can see um, a cost per lead based on 
uh, my marketing spend. But even more importantly from there, let's look at lead quality. If we then drill down into the lead quality, so okay, we got a lead from that, but did it progress to an opportunity? Was it the right target market? Was, is it who we really want to be going for? Is it the right direction for us? Did we quote them and did we win the business? You're going to then start to get conversion rates based on the campaigns that you're running and you're going to get a return on investment from the campaigns. So you might say, yeah, we spent the most on the expos. We spent 50 grand and we only got seven leads, but they were really strong leads because those expos were, you know, the right target market. And we ended up having a return on investment of, we was up by 120,000 pounds from the 50,000 pounds that we invested. And then the other campaigns might have, say for instance, the paper clicks, they might've returned, less and the Facebook ads might have done really well. So it really just does depend. So looking at lead quality and conversion rates is really gonna help you then again, make more informed decisions, which goes back to the third point, having better data and better knowledge um, of what you wanna do more of in the future. Um, increase revenue by understanding your activity levels and sales performance. If you're not tracking stuff like KPIs, then you might have an inkling that Simon is your best salesperson, but when you actually drill down into the data, well, Janet makes more phone, Simon makes the most phone calls and he looks the busiest, but Janet has the best conversion rate and she also has the uh, highest GP per deal. So potentially she's the best person. So you might want to look at remodeling your, your, your commission structure rather based on a flat rate bonus. You might want to change it, which is then going to incentivize salespeople to sell more. And obviously then your business is going to grow. You're going to increase revenue and you'll also be able to see activity levels across the whole business. You can enforce KPIs via the system, which takes a lot of time away from sales managers and spreadsheets um, you can have salespeople set up in the system with goals um, so those leads coming in from the campaigns you might say if, well if somebody's hit their target the next uh, next quarter or next month they're going to get the lion's share of the leads that come in bound because they've hit their target within the system um, better lead follow-up again I think that one's fairly standard I just spoke about the client that we had uh, where we've done the automations for if you've got a better lead follow-up and that might be that a lead comes through the website your CRM system should be integrated with your website so that lead through the website should automatically create a lead in your CRM system and it should automatically assign it out to a salesperson and it should maybe automatically send out an SMS message or an email to say to the customer, hey, we got your inquiry, Susan's gonna be working on it, she's gonna get back in touch with you in the next uh, couple of hours. In the meantime, here's a link to our website if you wanna see anything else. So that's really nice, because that really cements that good customer journey and it makes it look like you've got really good backend systems, which is gonna, again, give a really good first impression. Having more rigor and structure to your sales process. Now we see this a lot when we go into businesses. There might be really good rigor, really good structure and a great process for sales. But if it's not systemized, then you might have five different salespeople working in different ways. Um, very, very commonly when I, when I work with accountancy firms, um, if it's a, a LLP, so there's multiple partners who are working uh, for that, or own, who own and sort of share that accountancy firm, each partner might work in a completely different way and onboard people in a completely different way, send quotes out in a different way with different branding and different, there's no templates. So by having more rig, rigor and structure to your sales process, just say for instance, if you was purchasing something from Amazon, whether you purchase a, a beauty product or a new lawnmower or a water bottle, you're going to get exactly the same process every single time. Now, that's what we want to try and replicate. Now, of course, that's a transactional site, but what we want to try and have is that rigor and that process in your, in that rigor and the structure in your sales process. So no matter whether Betty or Susan or George or Dave picks up the phone to the customer, the customer is going to have a good customer journey and that same experience, whether who, no matter who they talk to. Um, by viewing marketing and customer analytics against the account record, again, will make that will ensure that you have that good lead follow up and it ensures that your salespeople or estimators or whoever's following up your account managers, they have a better understanding of what's happening with that customer. So again, if your marketing tool is linked up with your CRM tool, what would happen is if I send an email out to John Smith, John Smith uh, opens the email, John Smith clicks on the link. John Smith goes onto the website and he watches the video. Now, when that, when that notifies a salesperson within CRM or the account manager and they go against John Smith's contact record or account record in the system, they'll be able to see there in one place because you've got that integration. Wow, I can see that John went on the website at 12 minutes past. 
He navigated around for about seven minutes. Then he watched this video. Then he went on to the contact us form, but he didn't fill out the form. So I'm going to give him a call uh, without sounding too creepy and saying, we watched what you did on the website. You can have that informed uh, discussion and sort of know what, what he looked at and then where to guide the conversation from there. Now, of course, one thing is uh, really, I've already mentioned automation to automate these sales, uh, these tasks throughout your sales process to increase lead follow up, which is going to make you convert more deals. And it's going to give your sales people or account managers or estimators more time to actually talk with customers or new prospects. So which one is for you? Um, again, uh, top left, uh, I'm slightly biased. We've got Microsoft Dynamics 365, but I just want to sort of explain that um, that is not necessarily always the best product for every single business. It's a very large tool. So if you're, if you're a small business, um, probably one, two, three, four people, then it's not always going to be the best tool. Um, there's many different tools there that work um, that for all different sizes. Um, again, I'm just going to go back to the chat. I think I read out most of them and I want to just see if there's any here um, that I didn't bring up. So just there in the middle. Um, so I'll start off by saying that CRM is a bit of a minefield. So depending on your requirement, um, it's definitely, definitely not one size fits all. And the other thing to really take note of is sometimes the partner or the company that implements your CRM system is more important than your CRM system. And how does that work? Um, because HubSpot and Salesforce and Dynamics can all do very, very similar things. But if I have one implemented by a professional, one implemented by a contractor who does two days a week and he's also doing lots of other contracts and the other one gets implemented by a three-year-old, then I'm going to have three very different systems. Now, that the three-year-old might have implemented Microsoft Dynamics 365 and then you might have a perception to say, Microsoft Dynamics 365 is a terrible system. We had it implemented and it didn't work for us. And then the expert might have implemented a Excel spreadsheet or an access database. And you might say it works perfect. All of our people love to use it. There's a few nice little automations which save us time and it's really intelligent and we really like it. So it doesn't, sometimes it's more important to choose the right um, partner uh, that really understands your business and gets under the skin of the business and looks for the pain points and looks to see where you really need help rather than the actual product. Um, I've seen many different, um, again, I'm just talking about Dynamics because that's what I work with. I've seen many different Microsoft Dynamics 365 implementations that have gone horribly wrong, um, normally by partners that don't really specialize in it, or they do a load of different CRMs, or by partners, or not even by partners, by um, sole traders that um, you know just specialize in IT systems. And then all my systems, we have to come in and we have to rescue that project. I've seen lots of absolutely brilliant Salesforce implementations and I've seen really poor ones as well. Same with Zoho. Zoho is quite a, a cost effective. It's quite a low cost platform, but it can do quite a lot. It's very modular where you can start off with just sales. You can do marketing. It's even got an accounts package. You can do um, portal. You can do lots of stuff with Zoho and it, it, it matters more about the person who implements it or the business that implements it than the actual system itself. Um, there are some systems on here that, will only really do certain things. For instance, if we look at Pipedrive, Pipedrive is a very good lead management tool. So if you just want to look at leads, opportunities, activities, then Pipedrive is brilliant. If you want to do quotes and orders, then Pipedrive just won't do it. It just won't cut the mustard. If you want to um, have a low cost and flexible marketing and sales tool, but the sales tool does have some limitations, then you might look at something like Cooler Hub. Uh, I know a few businesses that have Cooler Hub implemented uh, from that company in, in Harrogate, um, who have, it's, you know, it's their own, it's their own software. Um, and I know them to use the system very well. These businesses that I know have had it implemented. Now, if you were to grow and you'd say, right, we want to do this and this and this on it, then yeah, you might come up against some uh, limitations and you might have to possibly look at moving but it really depends on what you want that system to do. You'll see a bit of a trend over on the right-hand side of a few Microsoft platforms. So you've got a Microsoft SQL Server database, a Microsoft Access database, and an Excel spreadsheet. It's very, very common that people will start off with a lot of spreadsheets, and when they move to CRM, the goal is to try and eliminate those spreadsheets and try and automate processes that spreadsheets can't do. Um, 
a lot of uh, manufacturers, a lot of sort of older businesses that might have been going for 30, 40, 50 years, um, a very common thing that I see is they might have had an access database or a SQL database that has been implemented by an old IT manager that used to be there 20 years ago, but he's no longer with them and the system doesn't work, it's falling apart. They have to go to this IT company every time they want it to be fixed and it costs them two days, so it might cost 1,500 pounds to get it fixed and it breaks twice a month and it's a nightmare. Um, so having something, uh, but I've also seen these work well. So having something, I would say, it depends on what your requirement is. Maybe you can uh, put it in the chat box or maybe you can even email me separately afterwards. And I'm not necessarily going to say, yes, Dynamics is the one for you. I might point you in, an, in another direction. It depends on the, the requirement that you've got. Um, but it, you really need to look at a few things. You need to look at what do we want the system to do now? Uh, actually, that's my next slide, so I'm gonna come on to that. How do you choose the right system? I keep getting ahead of myself. Um, first thing you need to think of is, is it gonna enhance our customer journey? Normally, if you're coming from spreadsheets, then normally yes. Um, but not all the time, because I've seen a lot of CRM systems get implemented and they just almost turn into like a glorified phone book. Um, and an Excel spreadsheet can do that for you, so it doesn't really make much of a difference. But you need to look at, can it enhance our customer journey? Do we see a return on investment, i.e. Is, is it gonna increase our revenue? Um, because a CRM system being implemented, it's very, really gonna it's very rarely going to reduce cost. It's normally going to be a cost, but it's an investment if you can see a return on it. Um, does it do what we want it to do now? but is it going to do what we want it to do in five years? Uh, that's really important to think of. So if you're a, if you're a seven person business, uh, but your goal is to move, uh, grow to a 25 person business in three years, well, implementing a really basic low cost system might be okay for you now, but if you're looking to take on five staff in the next 12 months, and one of those is gonna be a sales manager or a marketing manager, <laughs> If you have a low cost sort of basic system in place and you bring in a sales manager or a marketing manager and you say, right, we're gonna grow this business, they're very likely gonna say, well, we need more powerful CRM or we need a more powerful marketing tool or we need to be able to automate how we quote. So you need to think about all of that. Um, you need to think about how much you wanna grow and where you wanna be. So is it flexible? Is it scalable? Is it easy to use? You could have the most brilliant system that could do all these snazzy things, lots of bells and whistles, but if it's hard to use, then you might get a couple of people use it. So uh, stereotyping a, a little bit, but you might get a couple of um, maybe younger, more technical people um, or you know, just really use it well. And you might get a few, few people that have worked in spreadsheets and they've worked this way for 30 years and they don't like change and they don't like this new system because there's too many buttons. You need to think about, is it easy to use? Is it cloud-based or on-premise? So if you are a lot of manufacturers that we talk to, a lot of um, very sort of on, uh, very on-site clients, they don't mind being on-premise because people don't need to access the system remotely. And if they do, then it's not often they can use a VPN and they can, they can get into the system that way. But if you're, I don't know, a technology company, if you're a brokerage company, if you're a public sector, if you're education, if you're you know, any of these things, a marketing agency, then you probably want your system to be cloud-based, especially in a management position. You wanna be able to look at any given time, where's my business up to, what's in a pipeline, what's ordered, what needs invoicing, what's outstanding. You should be able to see all of that from anywhere, from any device, so phone, tablet, laptop, computer. Um, is it in our budget is of course an important one. So you need to look at a few things when you look at cost, you need to look at uh, implementation. So some systems you will be able to implement for free. You can just download a license and then, uh, or you can just um, purchase a license, download the environment and you just go, you start using it. Normally that doesn't work brilliantly because like I said, CRM is generally not one size fits all. Uh, most of you on this call have got very successful businesses. Some of them have taken 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 plus years to build up. It's very unlikely that a CRM system is just going to come off the shelf and work perfectly for you. You shouldn't be bending your processes to work around a system. A system to, should be able to be flexible to work around your processes and enhance your processes and your customer journey and user experience. So a few things, uh, the consultancy at the beginning and then the ongoing costs. So normally with ongoing costs, you've got a few things. You'll have licensing if it is cloud-based. You'll have a support agreement with the partner. So if anything ever goes wrong, user misses a password, something like that, you've got support. Um, and then sometimes updates as well. Uh, does it integrate with our other tools? Again, most CRM systems now um, that are, you know, 
worthwhile, will integrate because they're cloud-based. And then can we see ourselves, again, probably the most important partner, um, most important question is, can we work with that partner? Are they very set in their ways? Is it their way or the highway? Do they understand our vision and our business and what we're trying to achieve? If they don't, then they're probably not the right partner for you. So if it's a Salesforce, if you love the system Salesforce and your partner doesn't really get you and the implementation is not going well, well, it doesn't mean that you need to not implement Salesforce. It might just mean that you need to find a new partner. Same with Dynamics, same with anything. I'm very conscious of my time. Uh, that's my hour up, but I'm going to really speed through these last few things. I keep banging on about customer journey. Uh, the customer journey, I'm going to whiz through in, in this one slide before, um, before I come on to the last bit. The customer journey is a repetitive cycle. Normally, if you can resell to your customers, you want to take them round and round and round if you can. It always starts off, uh, by the way, everyone, I can send this slide out or if you want, take a screenshot of this because everyone always asks me for this particular slide after I finish. Um, it normally starts out with a need. So again, if you look at you know, all of everything that goes into buying a product, it needs to start out with a need. Um, after that, customer will generally do a little bit of research. That is when marketing really comes into play. When they, when they look up for that product, say if it's a CRM system, when they Google it or put it on LinkedIn or whatever they might do, look out to market, look on local forums, you need to be everywhere all of the time. So marketing needs to work with sales because the way it will work is they'll find, they will do a bit of research, they'll find you, they'll select you, which then turns from the opportunity into the quote, into the order. So you need everyone to be using the same system. Um, then going on to the purchase, through to receive, this is again um, more around the other side of the CRM system, which is more the customer service and account management. They get the product, so that might be, um, again, it could still be that you're marketing to them that whole time, like your product's on the way, here's a text message, that kind of stuff. They use the product, if they like it, then... Um, then they're going to look to recommend it to other people. But before that, you've got the whole maintain phase. So maintain, that might be if they've bought a CCTV camera from you, then you might actually need to physically maintain it. But maintain can also be, if you've got a service, maintaining that relationship, maintaining that uh, trust in your service or in your product. It could be a product as well. So that might be continuous marketing to them. So maybe an email that goes out a week later, an automated email that says, hey, you got the product or... Um, Joanne come out to do the audit the other day how did everything go can you fill out this survey or you know text messages that get automatically sent out at the end of the month to talk about their usage or their camera or whatever it might be but maintaining that relationship is also about continuously marketing to your existing customers so you're always front of mind so when they come to recommend it to somebody else that buying cycle starts again or they go around it themselves again how to connect sales and marketing, which is kind of what the, um, what the webinar is going to be about. So I'm going to come into that now. I'm going to hand over to Jonathan. What we really want to try and do is minimize the slots or the silos between sales and marketing by having them work on the same platform, whether it's HubSpot, Salesforce, Oracle, Dynamics, Zoho. It can be done on most platforms. Integrate your tools, get people working together. So the marketing effort can have a return on investment. You can see leads and salespeople can follow up. Um, what you want to work on doing is having a 360 de degree view on all of your campaigns. So again, those camp to have that, those campaigns can't be sat over here in MailChimp and over here in CRM. The tools need to be integrated. So you do a mail shot, you can see all the analytics in CRM against the contacts. You can go onto the campaign, you can look at the return on investment. What you'd ideally want to see in the CRM system is a campaign record. So it could be the New Year's Eve party. Uh, we had this many people, we, we sent this many emails, this many clicked it, this many signed up, this many attended, this many turned into leads, this many turned into members, if you're a membership organization, this many turned into memberships and they purchased subscriptions. Well, wow, I can see exactly how that marketing campaign and I can see all the sends, the surveys, the text messages all in one place. Um, all campaigns run through CRM, as I just mentioned, whether it's a pay-per-click campaign, an expo, a new product launch, a, a new price list being released. You really want to do it all through CRM. Um, better understanding of lead quality and lead source, how I mentioned before, and then a better understanding of return and investment of marketing campaigns. So I've spoke about how to do all that with, C with CRM. Now I am going to... Um, hand over to Jonathan. So that is all from me. So um, 
Rory, I'm not sure if you can hear me. I'm not sure if we're going to take a couple of questions. I've got my contact details there on the screen. If anybody wants to send me, you can screenshot this as well. If anybody wants to send me an email or a text or give me a call to ask any questions or they want me to share the slides. Um, but I'm not sure. Um, Rory, we're going to ask a few questions um, now or shall we, uh, are we handing over to Jonathan and doing some questions at the end? Oh, some yeah, have we, already been answered. Some quick, quick fire questions now. I'll spend about a minute or two on some quick fire ones for you, George. And then cool. we'll, um, we'll go on straight away to Jonathan as well. Fantastic. Yes. Okay. So the first question we've got here is from Harvey Morgan. And uh, how, how do you rate tools that are part of website build platforms like Squarespace and do these integrate well with other platforms? Um, <clears throat> good question. In, in terms of actual Squarespace, I've not used it before, um, but lots of web-based platforms that sort of piggyback off the back end of the website, <clears throat> they can work well. Um, it depends on how accessible they are and sort of what we can pull through to the website and whether it needs to be a two-way integration. So for instance, if the tool just needs to be one way, so it's like almost like lead capture, or it's taking data and putting it into CRM, then great. Does it need to be a two-way integration? You need to think about that. So you need to think about the compatibility with the system that you've got. Um, but yeah, in terms of actual Squarespace, uh, my knowledge is not fantastic of it, but, but many others um, normally pretty good at integrating with other platforms. So, so yeah, decent. Perfect. We've just got another one here from Charlotte uh, mm -hmm. who says, who asks, um, what would you recommend for a new business starting with one to two people and not much budget? Uh, am I better sticking off to MailChimp and spreadsheets? Um, not spreadsheets, but, but yes, MailChimp. Start out with MailChimp, I would recommend, because um, if, if you're looking to keep on top of accounts, contacts, um, maybe leads and opportunities, so maybe a bit of a pipeline functionality, uh, I would normally recommend um, uh, PipeDrive as a starter. I think in terms of user licenses, there's a free version, but I think, it's as, I think you can have like a, um, one of their decent packages for about six pounds per user per month. So like honestly peanuts, but it's quite a good platform. And then what that will allow you to do is get all of your data in one place. It, it, it integrates with MailChimp. You, you might not need it to at, at that point, but it does integrate with MailChimp, but it's going to allow you to have all of your contacts and accounts in one place. You can, you can attach Lee, um, you can attach phone calls, appointments, stuff like that. It integrates with Outlook. So I would say that's a very good place to start. Um, all those spreadsheets, you know, uh, I never say don't use spreadsheets at all, although I kind of did there just a second ago. Um, but I would always recommend if you can trying to systemize it in an actual platform, uh, because you can always, if you're looking to move away from that platform in the future, you can always export all of your data like, uh, into a CSV file and import it into your next one. Your next one might be Zoho or it might be Cooler Hub if you want to do some marketing as well. Cooler Hub really is a good platform for sales and marketing in the same place but it does um, require a bit of a setup. So um, thanks. It's spot on, yeah, brilliant. Again, just conscious of time now. Apologies, yeah. I haven't been able to get through all the questions there, but i um, happy for you to carry on there. That's, that's great. Thanks, George. Super. So I'll, I'll hand over to um, Jonathan Scott. So um, Jonathan, over to you. Oh, he's not falling asleep, is he? Uh, yeah, just bear with us two seconds, guys. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Can you see that, George? Uh, I can see that full screen. Yeah, over to you. Great stuff. Morning, everybody. Hope you're all well. Um, I think I'll start by making an apology. Um, if you can just see my bald head. Um, clearly, I wasn't thinking this morning when I decided to put a plum jumper on against a plum backdrop. So uh, feel free to uh, reassure us through the chat. Um, Actually, I feel quite at home today with the audience because I actually spent um, my youth, my first 18 years in County Durham um, and have lived in Yorkshire for the last 27 years. So again, feel free to ask questions in either dialect um, through the chat. Um, so I'm going to really focus on the link between CRM marketing and sales. Um, and I've really approached it with um, COVID in mind. Um, I'll try to apply the information both to B2B and B2C. Um, I haven't touched too much on the, uh, the public sector, but obviously a lot of what I'll talk about will still be applicable. Um, and I do recognize that um, you know, there'll be some people on the, on the call with very little knowledge and some people with more knowledge. So I've kind of tried to aim somewhere down the middle. Um,
So in terms of the agenda, um, what I'll talk about is, um, we'll give you a little bit of background about Northern Media. Um, I'll obviously talk about how CRM as a tool can be used to retain and grow um, existing clients, how it can be used to reach new prospects, um, how CRM can be used to reduce marketing and um, sales um, overheads, and, and also how it can be used to create um, stability as well. So a little bit of background about Northern Media. Um, so I am the uh, Business Development Director and the co-owner of the agency. Uh, we've been established for just over 10 years and we do anything from web development, SEO, Google advertising, social media, email marketing and um, marketing strategy. Um, we are Google accredited um, and we also have a number of members of our staff that are CIM chartered. And um, we're a team of 15 and, um, and we've round about 75 clients throughout the north of England. So I'll start off by talking about how CRM can be used to retain and grow your existing clients. So CRM can help you understand your customer wants and needs. And George has very much sort of covered some of this off, but just to sort of reinforce a few points. Um, by understanding um, you know, what customers are buying, when they're buying, how much they're buying, and what they spend, um, you know, we, that can help us understand more about what customers are looking for. And that's never been so important than it is now during COVID because those habits are changing all the time. Confidence is changing um, all the time. Um, but actually, you can uh, gather through customer research using your CRM. Um, so gathering information is key to driving the improvement of your marketing uh, campaigns and strategies. And I don't think you need to be afraid really to, to ask customers um, for that type of feedback. Um, a couple of recent examples. Um, last Sunday, for example, I took, um, I have four children, so I took the, uh, the family um, out for Sunday lunch last week to, to our local pub. It was all pre-booked. It was socially distanced, um, and I was quite comfortable with that. Um, it was interesting as I came out because um, I felt that um, I'd be interested. I thought the pub would probably try and gather more information around um, sort of what my experience was, maybe how I felt, and would I return, um, and if not, what they needed to change. Um, and that type of information could have been you know, sort of gathered um, through um, something like a CRM um, or email marketing or even face-to-face. -face research to be fair um, and they could have even maybe given me a discount um, to encourage me to to come back but um, I've had no contact from down the pub and there's just a little snippet of how a small business um, can use CRM to really understand in the current climate and um, how people feel um, you know what their intentions are whether they whether they're looking to re repeat purchase um, and another little example, a couple of days ago, um, I went to Beaverbrooks because it's my wife's 40th at the weekend. Um, and uh, I did click and collect. And I actually queued up outside the shop um, for 20 minutes um, to pick up a parcel, um, which I didn't think was great service considering they could have effectively just handed the box over. Um, but they have my contact details, so they would have been great if they'd actually emailed me and asked what my shopping experience was like um, and would have learned a lot about um, what potentially could have changed. Bear in mind, I was just picking up a parcel. Um, but again, the reason I'm making these points is that CRM um, could have been um, the hub um, under which um, they could have reached out to me as a, as a client to really gather that feedback. Um, CRM can also help you build much stronger, closer relationships. And, um, you know, having closer relationships with your customer in the current climate is critical to retention, particularly if you're in a competitive or a saturated marketplace. Um, CRM can serve a role in nurturing those relationships over a period of time. From a psychological perspective, relationships are typically built around things like listening to customers, trust, confidence, um, respect, honesty, having fun, and showing integrity. So what we need to do as marketeers is understand how CRM, email marketing, and social media can help us communicate better. The frequency and the quality of communication is obviously key, particularly in a market that is changing or where there is worry or concerns. Um, 
email marketing can be used to both tell and ask customers, um, you know, so you can tell them things about the business or you can ask them for feedback as to what their thoughts are. Um, but there is a need to find that balance between the tone of your communication based upon what your customers wants and needs are. Um, you can communicate things like promotions or discounts. You can communicate success stories. Um, you can communicate things like um, testimonials or your review scores, um, CSR-based information. So for example, charity, sponsorship, environment, um, people-based stories, long service, training, awards. All these things um, feed into building closer and stronger relationships with your customers. Um, big brands are now, you probably have seen this quite recently, and I don't know whether it's COVID related. I think it's been a habit that's been emerging over, over a, a quite a lot of time, but it seems to have accelerated, I think, during COVID. But big brands are now recognizing the need to introduce personality into their ad campaigns by featuring employees. Um, this helps customers really relate to them and makes the brand feel uh, feel real. Um, the most noticeable one recently is the Amazon TV adverts. And I don't know if you've seen them, but it shows the staff working and then going back to their families um, after work. Um, and that really just makes people feel like they're not just a brand selling a product, but actually they're just like you and I, and people relate to that. Um, the other thing that you can do to build close relationships is actually demonstrate um, what you're doing and how you're changing. Um, and the more transparent you are with that, particularly during COVID where perhaps customers are nervous about trading with you or visiting or buying, um, anything you can do to demonstrate and give that confidence um, will help nurture and improve the conversion rate. Deploying a multi-contact strategy is a great way to help retain, um, in particular, um, and grow um, clients. This is a little bit more relevant to B2B, but many of you might have experienced um, a couple of scenarios. So, um, and feel free to um, let me know this through the chat. So, have you had a situation where um, you've had one particular point of contact, um, that contact then leaves the business? and you have no other relationships in place, which then creates the risk of you losing the client. I've certainly experienced it, and I'm sure um, some of you out there have also gone through that process. Um, or another scenario where you deal, for example, with maybe one branch or one div division or one department, and they're your client, but you can't seem to get your foot in the door with the other parts of the business or the other divisions or departments. Um, or perhaps that you're just struggling to create cross-sell within an organization to perhaps the procurement being the responsibility of many rather than just the person that you've got the relationship with. The key here is actually have deploying a multi-contact strategy using CRM as the hub. Um, and it's therefore critical um, to the retention process and existing client growth and creating cross-sell. So therefore, what I do is encourage you all to collate data on all decision makers and influencers. So, you know, understand um, who sits above, who sits alongside those key people and who's actually having an input. And um, you quite often find where you have a contact who is effectively your one-to-one your, your, your -one point of contact, but actually the financial decision may be happening above them. So build a relationship with that person. The, the key here is how CRM actually supports that function because who is that person? What are their contact details? Describe their personality profile. Um, and that data can be held within the CRM. And that's really strong stuff um, for salespeople and account managers to be able to use when trying to reach out. And establish the role and responsibilities of those people. Um, understand their needs, their challenges, their motives. And we have some clients actually in certain sectors where they go, they do much deeper personality profiling um, in order to really understand fully um, who they're trying to reach and, um, and what is the profile of, of that person. Um, and actually, there's no harm in actually using CRM to reach out and um, to gather some of that information as well through, say, something like email marketing to ask some of those questions. Um, and then once you have that data, you can start to develop both a marketing strategy and a communication plan to build those relationships and make them stronger. Accelerate your reach and influence. So very much like social media, to have influence, you have to have an audience. 
which then creates that reach. The point being is that volume of data alongside the quality of the data is really, really important. I think George made a point earlier that it has to be an all-in scenario. There's no point having 50% of your customer contact records or 30% of your prospect records in the CRM. You need to do it for all of your customers and all of your prospects. Um, if you're in B2B, um, all of your customers and all those multi-contacts I mentioned earlier also need to be in the CRM. And once your data is clean and it's accurate and it's been segmented, you can then look to accelerate your communication. In other words, when there's confidence in the accuracy of the data, it's interesting then it now actually pushes you along, along a little bit to actually build campaigns and be more aggressive with how you then outreach and using the CRM because you, you feel you know the customers much better. Within B2B, if you're using CRM to prospect, a similar principle applies. The key is actually buying high quality data, but also ensuring at the same time there's a robust strategy and a sales process in place to define how, when, and what to communicate. You need to make it clear as to how you're going to follow up with the prospect um, gathering information at each stage to profile and qualify the opportunities. And therefore, as George mentioned, you, you, you're constantly cleansing the data, updating the data, um, adding detail to the data. Um, kind of gone are the days where you could just acquire a prospect email database and just assume you can bang out an e-shot and you're going to get you know, loads of inquiries. You need to work that prospect data over a period of time. Um, and if you're using CRM and email marketing to prospect, a good place to start is to buy a sample of data to perhaps create a sales process on how you're going to communicate with, with that data or those individuals. Um, and then ensure you have um, the right marketing collateral to support each touch point. So you have your process and then you think about those touch points and you then plan is what you're going to share um, with um, those prospects or customers at each of those touch points. Then when you've run a pilot scheme, you can stop, you can test, you can measure, and then you can start to refine your process. Um, I'll just jump on to the next point. Um, key to retaining and growing clients is the ability to be able to tailor um, your messages. So if the information we communicate to our customers or prospect is not relevant to their needs, whilst on one hand, they probably won't be offended. Subliminally over time, what we tend to feel is that the supplier doesn't understand our wants and needs. And that then creates risk to your brand loyalty. As consumers, we're often seduced into sort of trying other products and services because we feel like the company um, from whom we currently are buying doesn't understand or value who we are as a consumer or a buyer. And by continuing to keep our CRM updated with information we feel is relevant to understanding that relationship, we can continue to segment and communicate relevant information to our clients. Just bear with us two seconds. I'm just going to see if I can get the chat up because it doesn't appear on my screen. Just bear with us. Um, Create brand awareness and loyalty. So brand awareness and loyalty are really important factors that influence retention. If you communicate in high quality relevant information to your customers regularly, your brand and what it represents will be visible, which in turn creates loyalty. Once you have data and you understand those customers' habits and interests, you can then communicate information that will grow brand awareness and develop that loyalty. You can then run schemes that reward those customers for that loyalty, perhaps based upon um, how often they purchase, what, what volumes they purchase in, how long they've been a client. Um, and there's lots of examples out there, you know, in, um, in, 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 with other companies that have run um, those schemes, um, Tesco Club Cards, uh, Advantage Card from Boots, Nectar Points, Costa Coffee Club. Um, so these are examples where um, there are loyalty programs in place, but the, the CRM effectively is, is the hub of being able to deliver and administer um, those loyalty programs because they hold the information around customers' behaviors and habits. 
Um, and running CSR c- campaigns as well. Um, cust- CSR, for those people who don't know, customer um, corporate social responsibility are really campaigns out there that um, you know, show that you're being socially responsible. Um, and those will also drive loyalty to your brand. And so, while CSR is, is very much a corporate word, um, you know, every single business is, can practice an element of CSR. Um, it could be you know, going and supporting the local charity event. It could be a bit of volunteer and it could be sponsoring a local football team. Um, but the point is, is that making your customers aware that you are giving something back um, that you are volunteering your time, that you're helping local community projects will help develop that um, brand awareness and loyalty. And the CRM is effectively the hub which allows you to communicate that with your existing customers. Achieve repeat, stronger repeat purchasing. As your brand loyalty becomes stronger and you fully understand those customers' needs, and this will help you achieve a number of objectives, including um, improving the repeat purchasing cycle, um, create cross-sell and upsell, and also achieve stronger conversion. So I'm now going to talk about how CRM can help you reach new prospects. Up until now, I've very much looked at customers, um, but within this slide, I'll focus on how CRM can help you reach prospects and how it can help you nurture prospects. And so the first point is, is, is CRM can provide a key role on how it supports the business development function. So understanding your prospects helps businesses, business developers reach out with confidence and I've worked in organizations where um, they didn't have CRM and I've worked in organizations where they have had CRM. But think about two different scenarios. So scenario one, um, you give your BDM, your, your sales exec, a cold prospect database and you say to them, off you go, start reaching out to them, start getting on the phones and start to generate some opportunities. That's scenario one. And then think about scenario two. So I'm not going to give that prospect database to my BDM just yet. Uh, and I'm not going to ask them to start reaching out. What I'm first going to do, I'm going to do a little bit of market research on that prospect data. I'm going to look at their company, their clients. I'm going to look at their website. I'm going to look at who they're working with. I'm going to look at their target market. I'm going to try and see if I can find out who their um, decision makers are by maybe jumping onto LinkedIn. Um, All this information can be held on the CRM. Um, so you can gather intel around their marketplace and there might be, for example, some research projects or there might be um, information out there that you can glean online. Um, and you're going to maybe think about some of the key challenges they face in their sector. Again, that information is loaded onto the CRM. Um, you can then start to develop the marketing tools. So if you think about maybe one of the key challenges that they face, why not produce a, 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 an FAQ video um, or a white paper video which answers um, or provides help to the problems that they're having in their market. Um, so the point I'm making is that you're building the tools, you're gathering the intel, you're building the tools and that information is sitting on the CRM. Then you give that BDM access to that information before they then start reaching out um, to that prospect database. Um, there might be, you, might, you might decide to produce a video case study because you think that particular audience um, you know, would be interested in, in seeing that video case study or it could be a customer testimonial or a product information sheet or, or, or something like that. But the point I'm making is that you build the marketing collateral up in order to be able to support your BDM when doing that outreach. Um, you could, for example, connect that BDM on LinkedIn with that prospect a month or two before you then ask them to do that outreach. So that prospect sees the visibility of that BDM, who they are, what they do, what they look like. Um, Then you start really driving and encouraging the BDM to start reaching out um, to that prospect database. So they've got access to the collateral through the CRM. And they know a little bit of background about the client, about the market, about the challenges. And then you'll, then they're asking the salesperson to really follow it up. And that's when you'll start to get really strong conversion and you build the foundations um, and, and, and then, and this is actually very relevant currently because there are different challenges. So being a, so a business development person being able to empathize with those challenges is critical in the current climate. 
So some of you will be involved in doing things like public sector tendering or um, doing tendering on major complex projects or framework agreements and things like that. So for anyone that's involved in high value complex tenders where they, uh, a lot of work goes into that and perhaps where the decision making cycle might be six or 12 months, it's critical that you continue to communicate with those decision makers um, and influencers during that cycle. Um, so granted, you won't necessarily always know who all the decision makers are, but sometimes actually doing the research and trying to find that information um, can add some serious value. Um, and then recording that information in the CRM and communicating with those key decision makers and influencers um, can then pass, have a positive impact on the conversion. Um, and we have got examples of clients before where just actually keeping that visibility and um, that regular visibility um, you know, through that um, consultation process or that tendering process um, can have a really positive impact. It's almost like there's a familiarity to that company, what it represents, its values, its culture and the people within it. And then the, uh, the prospect is more comfortable um, with you as a, as a business and the individuals that work with it. And CRM can really facilitate the communication um, to um, those prospects and key decision makers. And in fact, we... Um, you know, the deeper profile on those individuals can give your sales and marketing teams the edge um, because you can shape your communication and approach to appeal specifically to those decision makers. And to use an extreme example in the past, we've even had clients that have adapted their CSR strategies um, or attended specific events or exhibitions or supported certain charities or tailored their product and service they're offering um, just to penetrate that specific organization, all those specific people. I'll just check how I am for time. Okay. Um, if you want to reach your target audience quickly and you don't have the data in house, um, the best next option is to buy some prospect data, which I've mentioned earlier. However, there's probably little point buying prospect data unless you have a CRM and unless you have a strategy um, to how you're going to follow it up over a period of time. And data can, prospect data can be quite expensive to buy as well. Um, you know, sometimes between 60 to 80 pence per, per, per sort of record. Um, so, you know, the key is just making sure that if you are going to buy data, you have a robust strategy in place to, um, to capitalize and use it properly and record um, anything within the CRM. Um, I think um, you do need to think about um, sort of how we create the sales process, which will outline your touch points. Um, we need to upload that data into the CRM. Um, we need to undertake research. What you typically do if you're buying data is you'll get basic data. You'll get maybe the individual's name, the contact records, the company um, name, but that doesn't really give you anything just than, than a piece of data. It doesn't really profile that, that opportunity. So doing research into um, that company or that prospect is another critical part before you start reaching out. Um, and also, um, if you are going to buy data, look about how you can then um, yeah, access um, those prospects through other channels as well. So you might, for example, um, look to import that data into um, LinkedIn, which I'll, I'll come on to in a second. Um, and also um, look at your marketing collateral. So if you are going to uh, reach out to prospects, look at what you've got in your toolkit. Um, and if you think it is weak, so if you think your website's weak, if you think you haven't got any case studies, you've got, you haven't got any testimonials, then, then start addressing those issues. Um, I think as George has mentioned, so we can use CRM um, to uh, effectively implement a, an email marketing campaign. Um, but I think just to take a step back, what we need to do is, is almost qualify and segment your prospects. Um, as we've talked before about actually the importance of segmenting customer records, the same certainly does apply to our prospect records as well. So if you take a cold prospect who's never heard of your company um, or your products, um, they need to be communicated with completely differently than a prospect who perhaps maybe you've had three or four conversations with or um, who have heard of you. Um, so if you think about um, how much time and attention a cold prospect will give you versus someone who perhaps already values your, you as a brand or a company, or you know, there's some credibility attached to that, the communication needs to be completely different for those two scenarios. 
Um, it's therefore imperative that you update your CRM as to where your prospect is in that cycle uh, so that you can then tailor how you communicate with that prospect based, they are, based upon where they are in that cycle. Um, I think particularly in B2B, um, we often fall into the trap of sending out blanket e-shots uh, to our prospect base. Um, and, uh, and it's a dangerous game because um, you know, you've invested in that data and, um, and, and it's really, you'll, you'll get such hot and cold responses. Um, so importing your data, LinkedIn uh, prospect data into LinkedIn, this is very much just kind of focused on predominantly in B2B. And uh, some of you may be already aware of it, some of you may be not. Um, but you can import and export contact records from your CRM into LinkedIn and vice versa. And given that Microsoft now owns LinkedIn, um, um, Dynamics is obviously, obviously a great tool to be able to facilitate that process. Um, as an example, if you already have data, you can export the records from your CRM and import them into LinkedIn and LinkedIn will try to find those individuals and then you can create a template message um, to then connect with those individuals. Equally, if you've got lots of connections already on LinkedIn, you can then export those records from LinkedIn into your CRM. The only thing to bear in mind is that at some point you'll need to um, profile um, those connections or those records because it could be a mixture of clients, prospects, suppliers, old work colleagues, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and whilst I don't profess to be an expert in GDPR legislation, importing your prospect records from your CRM into LinkedIn is actually one way of getting around the legislation because if someone accepts your connection request, um, they're effectively open themselves up to being able to communicate with you on a fairly open level um, because um, they've accepted that connection request, which then allows you to message that particular individual. Um, I've seen several companies create quite slightly different strategies on how they integrate LinkedIn activity with CRM. Um, but I thought I'd share with you um, where I've seen it perform best um, over the last 10 years. Um, personally, I think that um, when, prospect, when the prospect and the, the cold prospecting function is done by internal telemarketing or sales support, um, who was constantly um, working um, with LinkedIn um, to open up those opportunities and then updating that activity in the CRM consistently. And it becomes a constant cycle where they're reaching out to that prospect um, and then updating the CRM, reaching out to the prospect, updating the CRM. And that CRM record is becoming more detailed every time that next conversation has been had. Um, and then at the point in which that becomes an opportunity, so maybe that internal telemarketer has rang that person um, maybe six or seven times um, over, I don't know, a 12 or 18 month period. And the customer then goes, yeah, I'm, I'm now comfortable. I'm now happy to have a conversation with you guys. Um, that then um, opportunity is then elevated into maybe the sales team or a BDM. Um, to then follow up. Um, and I think the main reason why it works really well like that is because salespeople are notoriously, um, and I, I'd never criticize them for this, but they're notorious at actually going after the deal, um, if that makes sense, um, you know, looking for the low hanging fruit. And they're actually quite often ineffective at working things that are very cold um, where um, they can't cut a deal, particularly if they're um, financially driven and they have a target to hit. Only a couple of slides left now. Um, so I'm now going to focus on how we can use CRM to um, reduce our marketing and resource costs, which is obviously quite relevant at the moment. So whilst this tends not to be the primary motive um, for many marketing managers, um, CRM actually represents a, a brilliant opportunity to reduce the, the marketing budget. And the main reason for this is that it can reduce the need to have to invest heavily into new client acquisition and to satisfy the, those growth objectives. And instead that growth um, can be more easily driven um, through retention, existing customer growth, um, stronger repeat purchasing, cross-sell, upsell, and actually creating more referral opportunities as well. So that's a natural benefit 
um, from actually really improving how you communicate with your existing customers. And I've mentioned this before, and and George mentioned it earlier, the starting point is to really understand your customers' needs and interests better. Um, Because then actually what you will end up doing is, is actually you'll waste less budget on communicating things that aren't relevant to that audience um, you know perhaps you know, with the wrong messages or you know the wrong information at the wrong time um, and the flip is that actually by understanding those customers your conversion rate will definitely be improved by marketing the right products and the right services at the right times and george touched on this slightly earlier so um segmentation can take many forms through the crm but um by profile and categorizing your customers, you can then start to ring fence the strategies and the communication plans with um, those, those segmented categories. Um, so um, it helps you develop a communication plan. Um, and the more accurate the data and the more accurate the segmentation, the more confidence you will have in the automation process. Um, and this is sometimes where I think people get a little bit uncomfortable with CRM is, particularly in B2B is how much we take a step back and, um, and actually rely upon the technology and the automation to create those touch points. But actually, if you've got complete confidence in how you've profiled and segmented the customers, you then will become much more comfortable with the automation process, knowing that you've planned the message, you understand that that particular group of prospects or customers are interested in that because you've already profiled them and then the automation process communicates that um with with many other forms of marketing it is sometimes very difficult to predict who the audience is so take print media for example so if i'm a kitchen company and advertising in say yorkshire life or i think there's a durham life as well and okay they'll provide you with demographic data on their readership However, the reader could be male, they could be female, they could be 25, they could be 65, they could be earning 20 grand a year, they could be earning 100 grand a year, Um, they could have replaced their kitchen in three years ago or 20 years ago. The point is you you just don't know. Uh, And again, I'm not suggesting you stop doing any print media, but if you are, and it creates inquiries in footfall, footfall, it's critical that you then gather the data and then start to use the CRM to continue communicating um, and develop that relationship. And this is a good example of where, you know, it, it, it's in that conversational process with customers um, is gathering that information and then remembering to add that data into the CRM on the back of those conversations. Um, people tend to spend with confidence online when they trust the brand. And we've worked with brands um, that are fledgling and we've also worked with brands that are very strong. And it's interesting that despite the same approach, it's interesting to see how the uh, return on investment models differ um, based on the the strength and the trust that people have for that brand, even when the new brand has actually got price advantage. Um, So generally speaking, a trusted e-commerce brand will typically achieve much higher basket value, higher order value, stronger conversion, and less dropout um, at various stages of the purchase process than a new startup. So um, they will also typically achieve much stronger repeat purchasing, particularly during this point in time as well, when despite a lot of us moving into online purchasing, we're still nervous about um, security, um, given obviously what we've just seen recently with um, you know, some high profile um, Twitter accounts being hacked. So there is still, and, and it is a little bit of a subconscious process that we will um, turn to brands we trust, which is why Amazon um, I've, I've developed a brilliant model um, because actually despite the fact that we're buying from their merchants, we trust Amazon as a brand. But the key here is that communicating with your customers effectively using CRM can therefore increase your average basket value due to trust. So CRM is, it can facilitate the development of that brand trust, loyalty, et cetera. So we know that in both B2B and B2C, we can all be persuaded to buy more um, or we can buy sooner. Um, the two to one, the two for one offer, the 20% off, the 20% extra free and so on. So we, we you know, we're, we're all 
often seduced into the offers um, that um, people provide to us. But the point here is that if you already have really high quality segmented data, good brand loyalty, good products, and some attractive offers, you can influence the purchase frequency. But again, you have to have that knowledge um, of you know, those customers and those prospects. Um, and then once you do, you can automate how you communicate those offers uh, and that will effectively minimize the marketing cost to achieve um, the repeat purchase. And whilst this is a typically a strategy used within e-commerce and B2C, there's no reason why this can't be deployed to, uh, to most B2B sectors as well. So I've touched on automation. So without CRM, the more data you have, it actually becomes counterproductive because the more time you have, the more data you have, the more time intensive and disorganized communicating with your customer or prospect base becomes. So with CRM, you can automate all your e-communication to your existing customers. And it isn't just about um, promoting a product. Um, you know, it could include a thank you note. It could be a customer service questionnaire. It could be a contract renewal note. It could be a reminder. It could be an event. It could be a legal update. It could be a company announcement. It could be a new product or service, or it could, in fact, be an offer or incentive. But it's just thinking about um, all the different um, touch points that CRM can facilitate. Um, and there's an assumption as well, I think, particularly in traditional sales-led B2B organizations, that automation removes um, the, the level of control. However, the key is identifying the elements which don't need human intervention or perhaps are less critical or perhaps require less interaction. So in reality, automation is really um, is a tool to be able to reduce the amount of time that we, that we take, maybe communicating things that um, doesn't need um, a human intervention. And I also think that mm, the more the online marketplace evolves, the more comfortable um, I think um, consumers are, be, are getting with um, automation, particularly if it is relevant to their needs. Um, and the same applies to prospects. So the key is understanding the sales process, the touch points, and, um, and what elements of the touch points with that prospect base can be automated. Um, for example, if you wanted eight touch points with a prospect um, database over a six month period, and you might be able to automate 30 or 40% of, um, of, of, of those steps, um, what effectively you've just done there is potentially just reduced your sales overhead by 30% by taking 30% of their follow-up tasks away from them. So there's a huge cost saving to be done by potentially looking at um, automate, automatic communication. Um, naturally, if you're squeezing stronger results from your existing customers, this reduces the pressure to increase your budget in advertising, such as um, your digital advertising, Google ads, social media ads, uh, print media. And this is particularly obviously true at the moment because in quite a lot of sectors that have been hit by COVID, um, the cost per click rate, for example, on Google ads has climbed. Uh, I'm old enough to remember the last recession and the same thing happened then as well. So increased competition, um, market demand has dropped, um, which then creates almost like a bidding war on things like Google ads. And while I'm not advocating that you stop investing in advertising to acquire customers and growth, but what I am suggesting is that you use your CRM to maximize the opportunities that your ad spend brings in. nearly come to the end now um so i think this is quite an uncomfortable subject i think for many sales managers at the moment and we're having very difficult conversations um around um sales overhead um but crm and marketing automation can help reduce your sales team's overheads and to bring this to life i, I recently had a conversation with a sales and marketing director of a leading uh, business to be sorry, B2B and training provider in the UK, UK wide. And they have a BDM team, they have an account management team, they have an internal sales team. But due to COVID, their field-based BDM team have become significantly less effective. Um, and so they've also recognized that through a combination of digital lead generation, backed up by CRM, email marketing, telemarketing, and great account management, they can actually reduce their sales 
their field sales BDM team by more than half. And for them, that's probably about half a million pounds a year because their BDM teams um, are very much more expensive than um, their internal um, sales, telemarketing and account management teams. Um, so um, they've, they just, they've completely shifted how they've structured their marketing and sales um, budgets and strategies um, because they recognize that the current model just didn't fit um, with the current climate. Um, and whilst many B2B businesses still feel reluctant to change their strategy and restructure how they invest and in their budgets, it's something for me that should be at least be explored in the current climate. Um, and I'll scoot through this one a little bit quick because I'm becoming conscious of time. So obviously CRM again creates st stability because um, by understanding the customers better, you can predict their future behavior. So it's really important in the current climate that we, we understand um, what customers are doing now, what they're likely to do in the future. Um, and actually you can then market to them and sell to them with confidence. And um, if you have that data at hand, Um, obviously by um, being able to control the communication to your customers and prospects, again, you can plan a series of messages which takes customers down a journey to where you want to maneuver them into. And again, that creates control um, over the process. Um, and the other thing as well is that um, we know that in certain marketplaces that your customers are nervous, you know, in other marketplaces they're growing. Um, and in, as an agency, um, we have had two extreme scenarios. We have had customers that have gone out of business. We've had customers that are trading carefully through it. And we've had other customers that are growing very quickly. So if you think about how I need as an individual to communicate differently with this through diff three different scenarios, I've got to be really careful because if I start whacking out customer promotions and incentives, um, maybe to a business that's on its knees, just think about how that's going to be received. Um, and the other thing as well is that you'll find with some advertising, you get fluctuation in advertising costs because you get greater competition and things like that, particularly in things like Google ads. So um, within CRM, you can better control um, the time cost um, of actually en engineering that communication. I've mentioned there the, uh, the competition. Um, and also, as I mentioned earlier, there's far less pressure um, to acquire um, new customers. Um, and I think you've probably already heard this stat, but it's uh, the cost to acquire a new client can be up to five times more um, than retaining an existing customer. Uh, and that's it. Um, thank you for listening. Um, I'm just going to now, is there any questions? I can't see anything in the Q&A. Um, I don't think we do have any new questions, but if you do have any questions, uh, please use this uh, time to, to think and uh, maybe potentially ask one. <coughs> but yeah. There's a, there's a couple there in the chat um, that are sort of back related to uh, CRM, which, which I can answer now if that's okay. Um, one is, do sole traders need CRM? Uh, it really, I suppose, it if you're a sole trader and you're a builder, then probably no. Um, it, but it really does depend on, on what you're doing. Um, so if you are trying to acquire business, so you, you're working with leads, you've maybe got opportunities. If you have to quote, if you're sending out uh, offers or quotes, then then yes, uh, really it doesn't need to be anything fancy. If you're just by yourself, it, it might be a spreadsheet. Um, it might be something like pipe drive, how we mentioned before, something that's maybe free to set up and easy to manage, but potentially a spreadsheet will work. Um, but yeah, I, I would recommend having, having something because a lot of stuff will get lost. Pre presuming you meant spreadsheet or system. If you've already got a spreadsheet, then you, you might be okay with that. Uh, there's also a question about, um, would a CRM benefit a SME in the funeral and end of life sector? Um, probably same answer. Um, if it's that you're selling funeral plans and end of life insurance, if, if that's the way I understand it correctly, then yes, you're still going to have people who inquire 
um, you're still going to have to follow up because they're going to inquire to mul multiple companies. Um, so yeah, you're still going to need some kind of log of the inquiry. And then once you actually, um, if you class it as an opportunity, if, if, you, if that person purchases from you and, and then you progress, is there anything you have to do off the back of that? So do you need, is, that, is there like a project that you need to run or some order that you need to create? Um, would you want that? If, you, if you're doing that on something like Zero or Sage at the minute, would you want the two connected? Um, so I would say, yeah, there's always a need for it, no matter what the sector is, um, just so long as there's a process and something to build the CRM off. But I think that's it. Rory, I don't know if there's any more in there. No, spot on. Yeah, thanks for answering those. That's really uh, good, uh, detailed uh, sort of answers. I hope that answers those questions uh, for those who ask them. And yeah, brilliant. All I can say now is uh, thank you very, very much for um, delivering such a informative and um, valuable webinar to all the, uh, to the attendees today. And yeah, look forward to next time for sure. Yeah, well, thanks very much for having us on. And thank you, everyone, um, for listening um, to myself. And obviously, Jonathan, hope I didn't put you to sleep in my bit. Likewise. <laughs> <laughs>